So I noticed this video on a channel by a user named CFAPS7865 that caught my eye. It was his theory, which I think he adapted from Robert Temple's theory, about how the Great Sphinx at Giza was originally Anubis. Now I want to preface this by saying that I'm not opposed to the theory that the Sphinx's head was recarved. I personally believe there's no evidence to support a recarved head at this time, and I'll post the link in the description to another video I made that briefly explains why, but I won't rule out the possibility that it was recarved. Instead, my problem with CFAP's theory has less to do with his general idea that the Sphinx was Anubis, but rather the evidence he uses to prove his theory, his horrible methodology, and his assertion that it is impossible to argue against his evidence. Based on some of his comments, he believes you'd have to be an idiot to believe otherwise, and considering he has a large following that has bit into his theory hook, line, and sinker, I feel compelled to address what he's putting out there. There's three main problems with CFAPS's Sphinx Anubis argument. First, he doesn't analyze Egyptian artifacts to draw conclusions about other Egyptian artifacts. Uh, if he did, he'd probably come to different conclusions. Second, he misreads Egyptian hieroglyphs, which leads him to faulty conclusions. And third, he is interpreting evidence to fit pre-existing theories, rather than forming theories based off of the evidence, as seen in his interpretation of the Book of the Dead and Coffin texts. So this video is going to rip apart the core arguments CFAPS makes supporting his Sphinx as Anubis theory, uh, and by the end, You'll see it is definitely not a 100% proved theory as he asserts, and in fact you probably shouldn't take most things CFAPS uh, says at face value, because you can't be sure what he's telling you is accurate at all. I'll post links and sources to everything that is necessary in the description to support what I'm saying. Also, I have no desire to actively debate him about this topic, because there is nothing to debate. Most of his core arguments are based on fundamentally flawed information. Also, when faced with the flaws in his research, he becomes hostile and insulting. When I wrote my initial reactions to his theory in the comments uh, and pointed out some of his flaws, this was his reaction. Rather than actually addressing the topic, he just resorted to calling me an effing idiot and brainless, then hearted his own comment, which is weird. Okay, here we go. So I'll start off with my biggest pet peeve, and the part that should completely discredit him right off the bat, horrible research. We see this happen two particularly notable times. First is when CFAPS analyzes the body of this Anubis statue, and he realizes that the tail is exactly like the tail of the Sphinx. Clear evidence that the Sphinx was once, an, once Anubis. Problem. This is a statue in Vegas, not an actual Egyptian artifact. That would be like me analyzing the Sphinx in Vegas as part of the Egyptian archaeological record. It's insane. This is what tales on Anubis statues actually look like. Note that they are not curled up around the leg like the Sphinx. I'm just going to show several different ones uh, here. Now, I will add the qualifier that most of these statues are from the New uh, Kingdom, Late Period, and Ptolemaic Period, unfortunately. Very few Anubis statues survive prior to that. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. Regardless, from the ancient, uh, actual ancient Egyptian artifacts we have, the tales don't match the Great Sphinx. On the other hand, this is what Sphinx tales look like. This is from a Middle Kingdom Sphinx. These are some New Kingdom Sphinxes. And here is an Old Kingdom Sphinx that actually predates the Great Sphinx. As you can see, all of these tales are a match. 
CFAPs couldn't be bothered to look at Egyptian artifacts to realize the difference. This poor research is one example why not only his Anubis theory is bunk, but why he is not a trustworthy source in general. But that's not all. The other blatantly wrong piece of information, which again throws CFAPS's credibility into question, deals with his supposed claim of irrefutable evidence that the ancient Egyptians were directly referencing the Sphinx as the guardian of the pyramids through their hieroglyphs. He does this through his supposedly insightful knowledge of hieroglyphs, which he claims to be able to read at about a fifth grade level. The first part compares the glyph for sky to the structure of some false doors and images of Anubis on a case of canopic jars, and interprets them to mean guardian of the sky or something. I actually don't know what his point is here. I guess that Anubis is historically a guardian of the necropolis, which basically is common knowledge. Uh, if there were an Egyptian mythology for dummies book, that would basically be like the first thing they say about Anubis, but, you know, hey, I guess you need to find some way to seem insightful. Uh, then, CFAPS's analysis takes a little bit of a turn for the worse. Uh, he attempts to apply his hieroglyphic knowledge to the false door you see in front of you. He sees an image of Anubis next to a hieroglyph of a pyramid. Boom. Smoking gun. Anubis is the guardian of the pyramids, guardian of the necropolis, Anubis is the sphinx. Game, set, match. One problem, CFAPS, that is not a pyramid hieroglyph. This is a pyramid. Gardner sign list classification 024. It's a pyramid. Straightforward. However, this is not the glyph on the false door. This is the glyph on the false door, a canonical loaf, whatever that is. Uh, Gardner signless classification X8. In this case, it means give, and is part of an offering formula commonly found on funerary objects and false doors like this one. The offering formula reads, an offering is given by the king, followed by the name of a deity and list of offerings given. This one is to Anubis on his mountain. Uh, Anubis Mountain is an actual place, FYI, located in Abydos. Uh, it was a well-known sacred place for the Egyptians. Don't let CFABs trick you into thinking it's another name for the Sphinx. I could see that happening. Although uh, this false doors offering formula is tailored for Anubis, you also find them for, say, Osiris, like the one here, or uh, Wepowet, or others. By the way, this was all easily found on Google. It took me literally three minutes. The door he chose to analyze is the famous false door of Anket, and I found a translation of all of the hieroglyphs on that door. Plus, Ancient Egypt Online has an entry on the offering formula. And, considering CFAPS shows himself going on their website frequently to look stuff up, there is zero excuse for him to not have been able to find this information. I'd also like to remind everyone that CFAPS claims he can read hieroglyphic at a 5th grade reading level. However, he apparently can't even correctly identify a pyramid hieroglyph. Look, I'm more than willing to admit I read hieroglyphic very poorly. But even I immediately recognized that wasn't a pyramid hieroglyph. That means CFAPS is either pumping out poorly researched videos, which is just disappointing, or he's willfully misleading his audience to get clicks on his monetized channel, which is disgusting. So, uh, that's the stuff that's just blatantly wrong. Now, the stuff that's clearly a stretch, but he's pretending is 100% unarguably true. First, let's revisit his analysis on the body of the Sphinx. This is a minor one. Uh, he also points out in his 
analysis on the Sphinx, that the paws are obviously dog paws and not lion paws. Now, to make this argument, he compares the Sphinx's paws to these lion statues on the Qasr el Nil bridge, spanning the Nile River, wait for it, constructed in 1931. So once again, he's pulling that nonsense where he's comparing apples to bananas. CFAPs, if you're listening... Stop comparing 4,500-year-old statues to statues built in the past 100 years to try and prove your point. It's insane. Hell, I felt bad comparing an Old Kingdom monumental structure to a Ptolemaic statuette a couple of minutes ago because there were so many variables. Yet CFAPS is here comparing this and this like it's no big deal. The burden of proof is so low for people like CFAPs, it's mind-boggling. But anyway, even if we play along and compare Sphinx paws to Jackal paws, it's still a subjective analysis. The thickness and details of the paws varies greatly on the details of the statue, uh, of each kind of statue. Anubis statues tend to be a little bit thinner. Sphinx statues tend to be a little bit thicker. The Great Sphinx, whether you look at it pre-restoration or post-restoration, is somewhere in the middle. Not super thin to the point where it screams jackal. Not super thick to the point where it screams sphinx. And the level of detail on all the statues varies from statue to statue. Some have curved knuckles, some don't. The paws of the Sphinx seem to slope downward slightly, which means absolutely nothing in our analysis. So, looking at the paws doesn't do anything. Now, CFAPS' bigger point, and maybe his most important one, is that he believes the Sphinx and or Sphinx Temple is actually named in the Book of the Dead and the Coffin Texts. We'll start with the Book of the Dead, a.k.a. Book of Coming Forth by Day, written in the New Kingdom. The lines of interest to CFAPs read as following. This is from the Ani Papyrus. Quote, I sailed over the lake in the temple in the Neshmet boat. I have looked upon the Sahu of Kamur. I have been in Tetu. I have held my peace. I have made the god to be master of his legs. I have been in the house of Teptuaf, an older name for Anubis. I have seen him, that is the governor of the hall of the god. I have entered into the house of Osiris, and I have removed the head coverings of him that is therein. I have entered into Rostow, Giza Necropolis, and I have seen the hidden one who is therein. Now, CFAPS is going to argue that the house of Osiris is an obvious reference to Khafre's pyramid, and the house of Anubis is reference to the Sphinx, or the Sphinx Temple. House and Shrine are used the same, as the same thing in this context, by the way, before anyone gets all jumpy on me. Now, part of the problem with this is that CFAPS is just arbitrarily assigning these mythological places real-life locations. Now, sometimes this works out fine. As I said earlier, we knew, know that Anubis on the Mountain is a reference to a necropolis in Abydos, based on archaeological record. I'll provide a link or two in the description. However, CFAPS is ignoring the fact that House of Osiris is used over ten times in the Ani Papyrus, basically in reference to his general dominion over the underworld. His only evidence that the House of Osiris suddenly means Khafre's Pyramid is that in a line after the reference to the House of Osiris is reference to Rostow, like I said before, the name of the Giza necropolis. This might be notable, except that Rostow is also referenced a ton in the Book of the Dead, so it's not like that exactly comes out of nowhere, something else CFAPS doesn't bother to mention. Now, to be fair, Osiris does have among his many titles, the name Lord of Rostow. However, as CFAPS fails to mention, Osiris's major cult centers were at Abydos, home of the 
great Osiris temple, quite literally a house of Osiris, and Busiris, a.k.a. Jeddu. Also, CFAPS references a quote several lines earlier about riding in a Neshmet boat, which he mistakenly associates with a ceremony relating to the Giza pyramids. However, what CFAPS either is unaware of or ignores is that the Neshmet boat was actually associated with a festival held in honor of Osiris in Abydos. Part of the reason uh, CFAPS does all this is that by putting the House of Osiris in Giza, he is putting the House of Anubis, the line earlier, in Giza as well, which would make it, in his opinion, the Sphinx or the Sphinx Temple, supporting his theory. However, as I noted in the previous bit about the House of Osiris, he is basing his geography on a lot of faulty logic, and there's no good reason to think that's what the Book of the Dead is doing. So this is definitely not the 100% conclusive evidence CFAPS is claiming it is. In fact, using this logic of CFAPS, suggesting that Anubis is a guardian of Osiris, which, to be fair, uh, it's generally accepted that he is, we would see, think that Anubis would be wherever his dad is. So, in that case, he probably wouldn't be at Giza. In fact, textual evidence suggests he'd be at Abydos, or Busiris. In fact, from the Demotic Magical Papyrus of London and Leiden, we read, quote, I am the guardian of the great corpse that is in Upek. I am he whose eyes are as the eyes of Akom, when he watcheth Osiris by night. I am Teptuef, so, again, older name for Anubis. I am Teptuef upon the desert of Abydos. I am he that watcheth the great corpse which is in Busiris. Now, imagine if that said Giza instead of Abydos or Busiris. Cephaps would lose his mind. He'd be so excited. Now, CFAPS' theory also ignores the fact that by the time the Sphinx was being excavated in the New Kingdom, when the Book of Coming Forth by Day was composed, it was being associated, the Sphinx was being associated, with the god Horus, not Anubis. But that's what CFAPS does. He ignores historical context whenever he's forming these theories. Now, CFAPS also notes lines from the Coffin texts that reference the Lake of the Jackal, Jackal Lake, uh, Lake of Jackals, so on and so forth. Uh, like I said, these are attested to in the Coffin texts, which are composed in the Middle Kingdom. Unlike the Book of the Dead, however, there's not even a reference to Giza this time to help him make the leap to the uh, Sphinx. Despite that, this, once again, in his mind, is 100% unarguably a reference to the Sphinx at Giza. Now, first off, even if you want to argue that the Sphinx is really old, like 4,000, or not 4,000, uh, 10,000 years old or something like that, and that the Sphinx quarry flooded from time to time, discussion for another day. Uh, by the time the Old Kingdom had passed through the First Intermediate Period and into the Middle Kingdom, like I said, when the coffin texts were composed, the Sphinx would definitely not be flooded. No Jackal Lake there. Now, as much as I'd like to play around of where is Jackal Lake like we did with the Sphinx Temple and House of Osiris before, we need to take a step back for a minute. And remember, these are first and foremost religious texts. Look at them in that context. In the case of Jackal Lake, there are a lot of different lakes referenced in funerary texts that do a lot of different things. That's because lakes are sacred in ancient Egypt. They represent the primordial world. When the New Kingdom rolls around, uh, they actually start adding sacred lakes to 
these temples. They're pools of water. They add them to religious temples. Now, we're not yet in the New Kingdom, right? We're only in the Middle Kingdom, but the symbolism is still there and clearly present in these coffin texts. So while CFAPS wants to take Jackal Lake literally, you can't always do that. So, uh, that's just about wrapping up this uh, analysis or critique of CFAPS's Sphinx as Anubis theory. So with all that in mind, let's once again just recap what's wrong with his arguments. Remember, he is not analyzing Egyptian artifacts to draw conclusions about other Egyptian artifacts, uh, as evidenced by his analysis of uh, statues. Uh, if he was, he'd come to a much different conclusion. Uh, he misread Egyptian hieroglyphs, which led him to false conclusions, as evidenced by his uh, misreading of the pyramid hieroglyph. And he's interpreting evidence to fit pre-existing theories rather than forming theories based on evidence, as seen by his interpretation of the Book of the Dead and Coffin texts. So, if you think CFAPS' Sphinx theory is still bulletproof, you really need to rethink your concept of what makes for good, reliable research and sources. I'd also look at CFAPS' other videos with a very skeptical eye and start fact-checking everything that he posts. Thanks for your time.